from a bad example. Uh, and we looked at stewardship. And what we were able to see uh, is that we are mere stewards of God's possessions. Um, and really, when, when you take a look at that, and if you fully understand uh, what we were saying last week, is that everything we have, and I know that's hard to get and to grasp, but everything that we have uh, as far as our money, our family, our material possessions, uh, even our life uh, belongs to God. And, uh, and he's evaluating how we're doing with that. He's looking at us while we're in this life, and he's evaluating uh, how we're being a good steward. How are we managing uh, the resources that we have? So how are you managing your time? How are you managing your resources? How are you managing the talents that he has given you? Um, <clears throat> and, and if we want him to entrust us with more, then we probably need to be found to have been good managers of what he has already given us. And I say in your notes, and I had bolded a statement kind of like this last week, is that so many people tell God if he would only give them more, they would do more. Um, he will not give you more to mismanage. Uh, if you learn to be a good steward, then, and, and then if you learn to manage what you have right now, he just may give you more. It doesn't mean that even if you're managing good, he will give you more. It just means he may do that. But I can tell you that if you say, well, I, if I only had more time, then I would read my Bible. Keep trying. And you're going to keep realizing that those 24 hours in a day run out at the same speed, if not faster than they did uh, before. Uh, and every other resource is the same way. Uh, this morning we're going to look at uh, generational curses versus generational blessings. Now, uh, don't get too excited because I'm not going to give you some very mystical and deep diving uh, sermon today on a generational curse and ask, ans ask and answer every question that that wording or that title may bring up in your minds. That is not what I'm here to do today. It could be a whole lot more said about this, but... On Wednesday nights, we are studying uh, in the book of Genesis. We are uh, just completed chapter 9 last week. And uh, for those that were here, uh, you're going to hear in this first part uh, some very familiar things that we talked about uh, on, on Wednesday night. But I want us to recount a little bit of the scriptures that we read uh, on Wednesday in Genesis 9, looking at verses 18 uh, only through verse 27. Uh, and it says, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers, out, uh, told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out uh, what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, may Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth, may Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his slave. Um, what we're seeing here now, Noah and them have gotten off the ark, they have disembarked, the animals have gone their way, they've gone their way, uh, and his three sons uh, are, are mentioned here again. And uh, they are the ones that, the, that all of you and, and myself are descended from. Uh, we are descended from one of the three sons uh, of Noah because they were the ones that were starting uh, to be fruitful and multiply the earth after the destruction of the flood. Um, and so you know a little bit of time has passed here, but Noah's family, they've survived, they're off the ark, uh, and Noah has become this man of the soil, it says. He's, he's a gardener now, he's a farmer, if you will. He's planted this vineyard uh, that we see, uh, and then he has partaken uh, in verse 21, of too much of this wine. Uh, that lets you know that this wine is what? <laughs> maybe, maybe, but it's fermented wine, okay? 
uh, and I made a point Wednesday. <laughs> it didn't say he took one sip and then he was laying there naked. Um, but uh, who knows how much, but he drank, he drank, it says some too, so that may be right, Daniel, I wasn't paying attention to that, but he drank some, so it wasn't a whole lot maybe. But we know it was fermented, and people have pushed this around a lot, that, oh, when the people in the Bible were drinking wine, they were not drinking fermented wine, it was mere grape juice. Folks, that's not true, okay? Uh, it's very hard to make wine in the ways that they did, and it not get fermented, Okay, uh, and so that was the only way to keep it purified and all the rest of it. So yes, indeed, the wine that they drank, the wine that Jesus turned, you know, uh, and the wedding of Canaan, it was fermented. Uh, there has never been a problem with drinking uh, wine. It's been a problem with drinking too much of it, okay? But at this particular time, the Mosaic Law wasn't here. If you want to know all about those types of details, you need to go back and listen to my message Wednesday night. I'm not rehashing everything uh, in that. I'm going to hit these things pretty quickly. But if you notice in verse 22, uh, it says something um, uh, here uh, like it did in verse 18. When it mentions Ham, Ham it says he's the father of Canaan. Uh, and then here again in verse 22, it says Ham, the father of Canaan. Uh, so that must be important uh, when you're trying to study the Bible and you see something that is repeated and looks a little bit out of place there. It didn't say any, any sons uh, about Shem or Japheth. Uh, but here we see in verse 22 um, what Ham did. Now, I want you to know this is all we know about what, uh, what Ham did. This is it. It says, he saw his father's nakedness and he told his brothers outside. Okay. Um, that's it. There, there, you can have, go and Google speculation after speculation after speculation about this, but this is all that the Bible says. Now you go into verse 23, uh, and we see a contrast here. So Ham, he enters the tent, sees his daddy laying there naked, and he goes in outside and tells his brothers what's taking place. And then the Bible says here, but Shem and Japheth, what did they do? They did something different. They didn't do the same thing. They took a garment, laid it across their shoulders. They walked in backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Uh, and it goes on to tell us there that their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. So I, I would just be willing to bet you that the issue that Ham had that is he seen his dad's nakedness, right? That must have been a problem because it says he did that. It says he told about it. But what did his brothers break their neck almost to try not to do? See their father's nakedness. So that must have been, right, the issue um, uh, on this. Now, we went into great detail on Wednesday night about nakedness. I mentioned to you that nakedness goes into our shame. Whenever Adam and Eve f fell, the first thing they did was go and make fig leaves to cover their nakedness and their shame. So there's a lot to do when it comes to that shame. It's not just about seeing a naked body uh, or a naked person. That's not the major issue here. It's about being frivolous with his dad's vulnerable state and his shame uh, that he had there. But I digress. You go into verses 24 through 27, and Noah wakes up, some, and he sobered up, it said. He wakes up from his wine, it says. So he got sober, uh, and somehow or another he found out what his youngest son had done. It's important that it says his youngest son. Why didn't it just name Ham right there? But it says his youngest son found out what did he do. So what did he find out? That Ham seen him naked and told people about it. What verse 22 told us. So verse 25 said, then he said right after that. So all he has found out is that his, son, his youngest son has seen him naked and told a bunch of folks about that. And he goes and he says, curse be Canaan. Wait a minute. Who's seen his daddy naked? Ham. Ham. And I said Wednesday night, what an awful name for a kid. Don't name your kid Ham. <laughs> Bound to be fat, I think. Uh, but, uh, but he says, curse be Canaan. Hmm. Why don't he say curse be Ham? You want to figure that out? Listen to my message Wednesday night. Um, but curse be Canaan, he says, the lowest of slaves will be his brothers. So he just cursed his grandson because of what his son has done. Right? Okay. What it says. 
Uh, now, you, you see here that, that God did not tell Noah to say this, that we, can, that we see, all right? Noah woke up. Noah is saying this here. He goes on in verses 26 and 27 uh, to, to bless uh, the other two sons. He blesses Shem. Uh, he also says there, because uh, the curse on Canaan, he's going to be the lowest of slaves of his brothers. Now, it just so uh, happens that Canaan was the youngest of Ham's sons, okay? So I think it's important that it says Noah found out what his youngest son had done. His youngest son had sinned, and Noah has cursed Ham's youngest son. Um, but he blesses Shem, and he says Canaan's going to be his slave, because Canaan was a slave of his own brothers. Now, Shem is his uncle. And he goes on in verse 27 and um, blesses uh, and extends Japheth's territory. And it also ends by saying that Canaan will also be his slave. Uh, now, the Canaanite people, uh, if you know anything about the things in the, in the Old Testament, were some very, very wicked, wicked folks. All right. What was the mandate for Joshua and them leading uh, the, the Hebrews into the promised land, what were they to do with the Canaanite people? How many of them? Like women? Children? Every one of them. All of them. Did they do that? No, they didn't. And then they had, you know, half of the Old Testament uh, has, the, has the, the, the fallout from them not doing that uh, as you go and look at it. But they were supposed to kill everybody. Now, that means they were some bad people. I mentioned Wednesday night, one of the things that they would do was uh, sacrifice into some of these pagan gods like Moloch, and they would take infant babies and put them on these altars or on these idols, and they would burn them alive, you know. Uh, so you're talking about some pretty awful, awful, awful people. Now, remember that these folks are after the flood. Uh, okay. Uh, and it goes, if you were in my Bible study, when they, got off, when they got off the boat, God had still said that the, 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 the incl every inclination of the man's heart is still wicked. Okay, so the flood did not take care of sin. Okay, uh, and we obviously know that because we still have it, have it today. But what Noah was doing here was prophesying how Ham's youngest son would turn out. He prophesied not only about how Ham probably would turn out, and it was true, and I gave some references on Wednesday night, that Ham, I mean, excuse me, Canaan did become the slave uh, of, of some of, and his people did, uh, of, of some of the Shemites and some of the Jephites. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a whole lot of, of Bible there that shows that that prophecy came true. Um, but we know that Noah must have been in tune with God on this because he, he turned out to have been right in what he was prophesying. Um, but not just about Canaan uh, himself, but also uh, about how wicked these people would probably become. So it's kind of a prophecy against uh, the Canaanite uh, people. Now, did all of this happen to Cain, and did the Canaanite people turn out to be so bad because Noah cursed them? Can they go to God and say, listen, it's not our fault, it's Noah's fault, he cursed us, that's why we were this way. So again, it wasn't Noah saying, you are going to be like this. Noah was prophesying that they would turn out this way because of what he was seeing at that particular point uh, in time. Nobody made them act that way, they acted that way by themselves. Um, however, we can see from this account, uh, what we can see from it is that our actions very, uh, can very likely affect generations after us, okay? So Ham's action of what he did going into that tent, seeing his father's shame and his nakedness, being flippant with that, telling his brothers about it like in a mocking way, was bad enough that that, that sin and that uh, uh, thing that he did there has played out to where it has caused issues to, to generations uh, later on. How well we live our lives can, I say in your notes here, and will affect those closest to us. Uh, sometimes it's now, sometimes it's today we see that effect, and sometimes that effect can come later. All right. Uh, if you don't believe this, and you're thinking, okay, well, hold on a minute. There are people today that still make dressing at Thanksgiving the way they do because your grandma's grandma did it that way. Right? 
There are still some people that make some any other types of food or you do gardening or you fish or you sew or you fold towels all right, or you put your toilet paper over or under because somebody taught you to do it that way, right? We see those effects of our training or that influence on us generations down the line about things that stupid. How do you think when it, when it really comes to things that are of an intense spiritual nature that we'll see those effects too? We do. We see it in a major way. Uh, on things that happen. I preached a sermon some time ago called The Ripple Effects of Sin. And that's why it is just madness. And hear me when I say that it's madness, and I could call it any number of other words in my vocabulary. Whenever I hear people come up to me and say, oh, I don't want somebody talking to me about my sin. This is me. I'm not hurting nobody. Number one, you're calling yourself a nobody. Because you're obviously hurting yourself. But number two, if you think that your sin is only affecting you, you're naive. It affects everybody in close proximity to you. It's like a grenade. It's going to blow up anybody within the radius of the blast area. Uh, and, and that happens. You think, well, what do you mean? Okay, anybody ever been in a marriage where the person committed adultery? The other person? I'm not saying you got to raise your hand on that. But it was their sin, right? But did it affect you? Sure it did. Did it affect kids? Sure it did. Uh, plenty of pastors have fallen into all types of different sins. It was their personal sin. Did it affect the congregants that they were, that they were uh, shepherding? Yes, it did. Sin affects people around you. Your actions, how you live, are not just your own. They are affecting everybody that's watching you. Uh, and maybe not just, just watching you. Uh, but just because they're within your, your, your lineage here like Canaan was. Um, so, as we look, Ham's unrighteous actions um, and his example planted the wrong kind of seeds in the lives of his family. This is what you can deduce from verses 18 through 29 of, of uh, uh, Genesis chapter 9. Because Ham's sin... You got to think about this for a minute. Ham has just gotten off the ark. He, I mean, not just, but he's been off the ark for a while, but he was on it. He's seen the world prior to the flood, right? Then he is one of the eight people to get saved. His dad was one of the biggest reasons for that because God found favor in his father. And so Noah was a very righteous man, okay? Uh, and so now they've been off the ark long enough uh, for... Him to know uh, would have planted a vineyard and get some grapes and all to be able to drink the wine from it. And he's been out there long enough off the ark to where Ham, his youngest son, has had uh, at least uh, a couple of kids here. Uh, so they've been out there a while. You would think that Ham would be on it. You would think that he, of all people, uh, him and Sham and Japheth and Noah and all the ones that were on the ark, they would have been some pretty righteous people. So when you look at how, what, what has happened here, Ham must not uh, have, have um, lived up to par for his righteousness and where he should have been with the Lord. And you were going to know that that was going to affect people within, within his life. Just that little thing and how flippant he was uh, with his dad's nakedness and shame. Now, he wasn't cursed, but uh, his, his youngest son was, and we don't know. Maybe his other kids were not. Uh, but we're being watched every day of our lives uh, by the people that we come in contact with. If you, uh, for instance, have a, um, a big sticker that says, I love Jesus, or a uh, fish or something on the back of your car, but yet you have problems with road rage, and you go down, and you give people the one-finger salute and holler at them and all that kind of stuff, uh, I wonder if that affected those people that seen that fish or that uh, bumper sticker on the back of your car. Huh? What's, what have you done before you've seen that? You've got, look, that person, they call themselves a Christian. Look how they're acting right there. Hmm. So it's not just, it's, it's, it's maybe people that are sitting at a restaurant watching you, wondering if maybe are you going to bless the food or how are you going to act towards that waitress or waiter. Or maybe it's your coworkers that you work around, that you feel a little bit more relaxed and you talk a little bit more and have a little bit more 
potty mouth and jokes and all the rest of it than you would if you were somewhere more, more respectful. But you don't think those people are watching you? They know you go to church. You've mentioned it to them before. You invited them to the passion play. And they're wondering why six months later you're telling them this very vulgar and nasty joke. Been there, done that, folks. Myself, personally, I had an employee, just so I can humble myself here, I had an employee when I was working for Chick-fil-A, and I had just, I don't know what all I was saying and, and different things, and had, had said a lot, I guess, over the uh, past uh, year or two that I had been there, and I had just so mentioned that I was a youth pastor, and uh, my cook, he, he looked at me, he said, you're a youth pastor? And I went, oh my land. I have just ruined my witness. Ruined it. Ruined it. Very difficult to get it back. Okay? So I'm right here with you. We, we've, we've done it. We've done it. So the bad things that we do, those, those sins or whatever the case may be, uh, they do affect people. But I particularly want to talk about this morning our children. Our children, our generations that we have. Uh, you know, for instance, let me just say this. You got a, let's say you got a daughter, right? And, and you, want, you want to have uh, that daughter, because I've got to say this because I have a little one back then. Bless her heart, I've put her to sleep already. Uh, but uh, I'm not just going to let any, any dude do her any way, right? And one of the hardest things for me, and me and Brooke go through this all the time, is she's going to watch how I treat her mother. And she's going to think that that's an example of how somebody ought to treat her. So I've got to be real, real careful. A lot more careful than I have been, probably, about things like that. I think a lot about it sometimes after the facts on there. But, but our daughters, let's say that you I've seen, and I, I, I have young women that work, with, work for me. And, oh, man, I, I hate to step on some people's toes maybe in here, y'all, but I just got to, you know, I just have to say, here I was telling you a while ago a piece of vulnerable stuff about me, so I've got to be fair across the board here. <clears throat> when you were just living with anybody and sleeping with anybody uh, and your daughters are seeing that you don't care about whether you're married or not and all the rest of it, or if this is if you're a woman or if you're a man, how, what kind of example do you think that is to your children? that are right there in the home with you. You know you don't want that for your children. You know you don't want that for your daughter, and you don't want that for your son. So why are we letting them see our example like that? Why do I, same way, I, my kids see some bad examples out of me uh, at times, there's no doubt about it. It's, you know why I allow that to happen? Because I'm not thinking about this. This is not top of my mind. I'm just thinking, hey, here we are today. It's not going to be a big deal. But it can absolutely be something that is going to be detrimental to our children down the road. Amen. So that brings us to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, that I think is going to blow some people's minds. We quote this so incorrectly. I just quoted it incorrectly on tape Wednesday night. We quote this and we'll say, if you train up a child in the ways of the Lord, then he will not depart from it. There is not a translation on the planet that says that. How many times have you heard it quoted like that? If we train up a child in the ways of the Lord, that in the ways of the Lord part. Do you see that up there? It ain't up there. It says, train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, you assume that in the way he should go is in the way of the Lord. But that's not what that verse is, is saying. It, uh, you read that in. You may be a person that says, I want my child to be this way. And that way may be wrong. People parent very, very differently. All right? And this verse is in no way saying, it is obviously not a guarantee if you train a child up to love God, it's not a 100% guarantee that they will be saved. Do we understand that? This verse cannot possibly be a 100% guarantee that they will be saved. We ought not quote it that way. It's wrong to do that because you know that there ain't nothing that you can do that can make your kid be saved. It's a personal decision that they must have, right? All this gives us as parents is the calm assurance 
that how we train our children is how they're probably going to turn out. They're not going to turn away from those ways we trained them up with. That's what this verse is talking about. So, let's flip it on just a second. If you train your kid up to not be a good steward, and that's the way you think they should go, then this verse applies. They're probably not going to depart from that either. And you see that. You see that, those bad things, and, you, and we, wonder what, we wonder sometimes, we go, you know, I, I put it in your notes, and people go, I don't know what's happened to my kids. I raised them in church, I had them in church every Sunday. Folks, read what I put right here in your notes. I'm here to tell you folks, this is in my language, I wrote it. I'm here to tell you folks, the little time your children are at church will never be as impactful as the large amount of time they're with you. You saying you brought them to the doors of the church for what? Y'all don't even listen to everything I say. These kids are out here playing in the yard right now. Then they're going back there. They don't get an hour's worth of Bible instruction. They don't always get good examples at church because we're human and we provide them with some bad examples sometimes. They see other bad examples that are here. Bringing them to this building does not guarantee they're going to be raised right. You raise your own children. It's not our job to raise your kids. It's not my job to raise you. Y'all supposed to already be raised. Some of you? A little suspect. I don't know. There's a, there's a man that knows his area of opportunity. Uh, <laughs> but I'm right here swimming with you, Sean. We're paddling, okay? Um, but, but, folks, I can't scream at you as much about the importance of how we ought to be training up our children in the right way with the things we say. You know what? You get home, and boy, this is difficult. This is difficult for me, and I have to really play around uh, with this to make sure I don't do it. If you're in ministry, it's a tough thing sometimes. But the worst thing I could do would be go home and be negative about church or ministry or let my kids know sometimes about some of the inner working battles that are here in church. Y'all don't always know all of that kind of stuff. You may not show up if you knew all the time of battles that happen you know, around sometimes. You're not supposed to know about every inner working. You're just supposed to know that sometimes those things do happen. But the worst thing we can do is go home and let our kids know or argue in front of our children uh, and, 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 and let our kids see us doing something that we're going to expect differently out of them later. And so we think sometimes when we come to church and, hey, I'm a pastor and all that stuff, but if I tallied the things that are at, at home and some of the things that I say or some of the things that I do, I don't want my kids doing that. I don't want my kids saying that. Brooke saying, oh my gosh, is he really saying this? I, I'm, not telling them spe- I'm not telling them specifically. We had this conversation a lot. But it's very, very impactful. I can look at my life and see how those things have impacted me in a major way. And I'm the pastor. And I know, I know better 100%. And so do you. But not just our children, though. The people that are in our sphere of influence. Those people, I have to be careful that I don't engage in certain things in my workplace that I would be ashamed of somebody knowing that I was engaging in that type of a conversation. They look at me, they're watching everything I do and everything I say. Y'all do the same thing to me here, and by the way, I do it to you too. So it's reciprocal, and that's okay. But we've got to stop for a moment and we've got to stop thinking so selfishly that all of these things that we have, these things we do, the things we say, as long as the pastor hasn't heard it or as long as somebody else uh, that at my job didn't know that I did this or whatever, I can guarantee you that, that somebody's seeing how you're acting or hearing how you're talking uh, and, and God does that. And your sin that you may have, why it's so, so important when I'm talking about these kids, these kids don't have a chance if you're not teaching them right at home. And I mean they do really have a chance. That's my human stuff, giving them 
uh, you know, given that limitation on there. But that's why, folks, whenever I hear people talking and, and we, 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 we fussing because the kids are a little bit rambunctious in Awana, or we're fussing because they're a little bit rambunctious on the bus or whatever, you know why? Because they don't have anybody to train on what right. So can we undo everything for them? No. What, the time we have with them will never be as impactful as the time they have at home, but we can plant some seeds that are going to have God to grow and that we can make a difference inside of that kid. I am living proof that the church can be a part of helping break a generational cycle. Now, I don't really want to talk about curses and or blessings, but I, I'm going to say cycles. We have generational cycles of blessings, not just the bad things. When you train your children upright, when you provide your children with, with a good, positive upbringing, do they always turn out perfect? Absolutely not. Neither did you. Um, but, that, but I can guarantee you that scripture still holds. They are going to return. Odds are they're going to return to the way you train them. You know all your life, in your 20s, in in your 30s, which is where I'm at, <clears throat> you're fighting to not be like your mama and daddy in them. But you finally get to about 40 and you start realizing, I'm just like them. You start, I even look like my, I'm trying to sound like my mama and daddy. I'm doing this. And, and then you finally have to get, you finally release and say, you know what? That may not be a bad thing. Right? Takes you about 30, 35 years. Uh, I'm looking at some things going, ooh, I hope not. Uh, I had some, I'm not being ugly, but I had some pretty bad examples, so I'm, I'm a little bit okay if I don't see everything happening. But I do see a lot uh, of different things, even from my mom and dad uh, that are out there. But you, you do that, especially you recognize those things when they're good. And you were fighting against that for, for a long time. I'm asking you to do a survey right now, as I've done a big, a big survey over the past uh, a couple of days. What kind of example are you being to your children, really? So don't think about the times you're sitting around doing Bible studies and all of that stuff, but you know that you're acting right there. How are you when, you're, when your game is, when the football team you have is losing? <laughs> People are thinking, how are you if you're out there and you lose the biggest bass that you think you may have hooked before or... Or whatever the case may be, all right? How are you acting in those normal moments that you really don't think people are looking at you? Because that's, those are the ones that God is really looking at on there. He expects that you're going to act right at church. He expects that we're going to act right when we're sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner with our family and all that other stuff. But when you get home and you're in your night clothes, whatever those things are, and you're sitting there, how are we acting then? Because our kids are still listening. Our spouses are still listening. God is still listening. And when you're at work and it seems to be comfortable, they're still listening. And I know this is, this is a big thing for me, but I don't want to get to my judgment day. And when he's evaluating me, so I preach this after stewardship, when he's evaluating how I managed, and he says, you know what? You really started some bad generational cycles with, how, with the example that you set here, 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 and here. And then I'll be so far down the road, I'll be able to see some of the impacts of my training and how that was different, whether that be church or home or whatever the case. That would be heartbreaking. What I'd want him to say when we come out as precious stones is, look, you built a wonderful foundation, and look how they built upon that in a positive way. Isn't that what we're trying to do across the board? Let's really take a survey of ourselves at times and look and understand if we don't want our children doing that, saying that, doing that, or whatever, nor should we, okay? If it would embarrass us if people knew that, that, that we said it, it's embarrassing that they would say it, and all the rest of that, because it really does impact. I want to be able to say I cut... You know, that thing is, why did mama cut the ends off of her roast beef? And they kept asking about why, 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 and it got back to the great-grandma just didn't have a pan big enough, you know? 
So, and that's the reason why they started doing that. Sometimes we don't know, right, how we may have impacted somebody. My dad said years ago that he didn't like cheese on his hamburger. And for years, I would never eat cheese on my hamburger just because he said that. And I was like, stupid, stupid, stupid. It's so wonderful with cheese. Why did I listen to that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Man, you never know. He just said that one, he said that one day at a, at a Burger King when I was about four years old, and for 10 years or so, I did not eat cheese. He didn't think, hey, I'm going to steal and my son don't eat cheese. Sometimes, like I said, it's those one-off things we don't even realize people have heard or watched us say and do. So we've got to be on our game as best we can every moment of every day, lest we lead people astray. All right, let's pray.